having a few technical issues here, but I'm sure we'll be fine. So um, welcome to a seminar given by Dr. Tanya Humphrey on World Coffee Research. Okay, so a um, few housekeeping things to get through first. Not working. Yeah, right. Just bear with us, having a few technical issues. There we go. I'm your facilitator. Okay. So, acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. I pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Okay, a few housekeeping things. Um, the seminar will run between uh, 10 and 11, a few minutes, we're running a few minutes late, obviously. Uh, there will be a QA and a session at, at the end of Tanya's presentation. Please, if you'd like to ask questions, use the Q&A tab, not the ch chat. Okay, please use the Q&A tab and we'll uh, attempt to get those questions addressed at the end of the seminar. So um, before I introduce Tanya, I would like to introduce World Coffee Research. So UQ has had an association with World Coffee Research for two or three years now. But uh, in brief, World Coffee Research is a non-profit agricultural research organisation formed by the worldwide coffee industry with the overall aim of transforming coffee producing into a profitable, sustainable livelihood that can meet rising demand. With a focused research portfolio centered on high performing coffee varieties, World Coffee Research is launching a global breeding network, bringing together partners in many coffee producing countries. So bearing that in mind, a World Coffee Research contacted UQ a few years ago to develop a breeding program assessment tool specifically designed for coffee breeding programs. So um, I, together with colleagues here at UQ, Craig Hardner and Mark Dieters, we put together a breeding program assessment tool specific for coffee. It was a modification of an existing tool that uh, I have been using in the BPAP project, which is a BMGF funded project. And to date, we have completed two BPATs, two assessments of coffee breeding programs in the World Coffee Research portfolio, one in Ethiopia and one in Uganda. Okay, so that leads me to an introduction to Tanya. So Tanya Humphrey is the Director of Research and Development of World Coffee Research and oversees their research portfolio. She is passionate about innovation in agriculture and combines a business approach with a strong understanding of science to achieve real world impact. And I'm sure we're all very pleased to hear that. Tanya holds a PhD in plant science from the University of Queensland. So welcome back, Tanya. <laughs> And in her early career, she held research positions at both the University of Toronto and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Prior to WCR, Tanya served as the Vice President of R&D at Vineland Research and Innovation Centre in Canada, where she led a team of scientists, engineers and technical staff in plant variety development, biocontrol and automation technologies for a wide variety of crops, including apples, greenhouse, vegetables, roses, and sweet potatoes. So I'm sure there are many people listening in that will have a, um, a keen interest to hear what Tanya has to say. So I think without further ado, I shall um, let Tanya take the, take the chair. Great. So thanks, Chris, for that introduction. And I'm certainly very happy to be here back at UQ after, I dare I say it, 20 years ago that I graduated. So it's a little bit surreal to be here, but certainly happy um, to be talking to everyone about coffee now and, and exploring potential areas for collaboration uh, in the future. 
So I just want to start by saying I too uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respect to their ancestors and descendants. So I might get started uh, into this presentation. Uh, I noticed it's called a science seminar, but I feel like I'm a bit light on the science. I'm, I'm giving you today really a, an overview of our organization and what we're trying to achieve because we, we view science as our tool, the way in which we achieve uh, things out in the real world. And so we have a fairly ambitious agenda and that's, that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today. And so I'll give you a bit of an overview of what we're doing and I'll be happy to take questions at the end. So a little bit about us. So World Coffee Research uh, is an industry association. So we represent the coffee industry. So we have members made up of more than 200 companies across 27 countries. So some of the, the uh, big, big players, some of the logos that you will probably recognize here represent some of our, our large multinational members. But we have members that range the whole gamut from giant multinationals like Starbucks and Lavazza down to individual um, uh, coffee shop owners and coffee roasters uh, in, in countries all around the world. So basically any, anyone who believes in investing in coffee R&D uh, to support you know, the future of coffee uh, production around the world. So we think of ourselves really as a bit of a bridge. You know, our organization uh, was set up to create this mechanism to allow the coffee industry, being the roasters uh, and the coffee companies, to invest back into the production end of the supply chain. So the uh, pr producing countries, uh, farmers, and particularly the national coffee institutions. So the research organizations, the typically public funded government research organizations in the coffee producing countries, because traditionally they are the ones who did coffee R&D, yet it's the roasters and, and the, the consuming end of the, the chains in the consuming countries who are benefiting from that. And so this, our organization provides the mechanism to allow for the funds and the coordination and investment into, into coffee R&D in the, in the producing countries. So why WCR was formed, uh, it was basically, you know, around uh, 10, 12 years ago, the, the coffee roasters in consuming countries got together because they were increasingly concerned about coffee supply, uh, especially uh, as we face uh, climate change and global uncertainty, uh, the coffee supply is at risk. And these companies, obviously their livelihoods depend on a strong supply of coffee from producing countries. So as we get more heat with global warming, we get climate unpredictability, rain, uh, more extreme drought events, storms, heat waves, frosts, changing, shifting patterns of pest and disease pressures, all of this is contributing to a, a, a higher degree of risk in the coffee supply. And so the coffee availability and the quality becomes unpredictable, which is really of concern to coffee companies. You know, we see increased cost of production, loss of financial resilience for farmers producing the coffee. Uh, and ultimately the, the companies, are, companies are concerned for their own uh, livelihoods. They're facing uncertainty in supply uh, and increasingly, they're also being held accountable for their own supply chain. So they really need to really need to think about the whole supply chain from production right to the end consumer. And they want more visibility on that. And they want to also preserve the diversity of different coffee origins. So if you look at this little chart here, I think it illustrates this point really nicely. So um, this is global coffee production uh, in the top three producing countries, Brazil, Vietnam and Colombia, we see over the past few decades coffee production has really increased and these three countries are pulling way ahead of a lot of the other coffee producing uh, nations who are really struggling to keep up and so there's a whole lot of reasons for this a, a big part of it though is innovation so Brazil Vietnam and Colombia have heavily invested in innovation both on the production side so production systems and productivity but also in varieties so those two things together um, have really help these countries uh, pull ahead and as a result of this the what we're seeing is consolidation of supply and so increasingly coffee companies are sourcing from these three countries 
and the, the whole system has less resilience. And what, so what we're trying to do as an organization is the other countries um, bring them up. So increase the amount of innovation in coffee coffee production in the other countries to bring them up to a similar level so that we we are in a world where we have you know preserving that diversity of uh, countries that are producing coffee all around the world ultimately we don't want coffee just coming from three sources we want it to, to preserve that diversity so as as an organization our strategy uh, is to focus on 11 uh, focus countries. So you can see them here, Nicaragua, Mexico, Peru, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and, and a few others. So these, these are where we focus. These are the primary countries where we, um, we are directing our the benefits, uh, expect to get the benefits of our work, but we do work in other countries where there is a strategic partnership opportunity. And so El Salvador and Rwanda, um, even though they're not huge coffee producing countries, the strategic value in the partnerships we have there with the National Coffee Institutes. So those are our countries that we work with as well. Similar, we, we work and partner with the US, uh, particularly in Hawaii, uh, and also while we're here in Australia, because we see strategic value in collaboration and partnership, even though it's not one of our target um, countries uh, from a production perspective. So together, these, these countries countries represent 50% of the world's coffee farms and 30% of the global supply of coffee. So we're targeting the benefits uh, to be focused here. And I know I think for this audience, I don't need to sell the benefits of plant varieties. I think, you know, plant breeders, varieties, you know, in, in agriculture, we understand plant varieties are the fundamental building block of any productive agricultural system. And certainly the productivity gains that we've seen in other crops is what we're trying to do in coffee. Uh, so here's a nice picture that illustrates this. You know, when I, I speak to our coffee company, the, I was in a board meeting last week in Italy, they don't intuitively get this. Why are you focused on plant varieties? You know, wh why not do other things? But I think, uh, you know, this audience, should get it. Uh, but this, this picture illustrates it quite nicely. So these are two coffee trees on a farm in Brazil. Coffee tree on the left is infected with coffee leaf rust, which is the biggest disease worldwide in coffee. And you can see this tree is not productive, it's not producing, it's not likely to survive much longer. So that is clearly devastating for, for farmers, you know, a coffee producer. The one on the right is coffee leaf rust resistant, uh, very vigorous productive tree. So in, in one picture, we can illustrate the importance of plant varieties and why we need to, to focus there as an organization. This is another comparison I think is really um, illustrative uh, to illustrate really how far behind coffee research is. So if we compare coffee with another horticultural crop, strawberries, so there's six and a half thousand odd strawberry varieties that have been developed and registered in the International Plant Variety Database, UPOV. Um, yet global strawberry production is about fifteen and a half billion dollars worth. Um, so, you know, that's nice for strawberries compared to coffee, where we only have 100 uh, varieties registered in U UPOV, but global pro coffee production is worth $200 billion. So you can see the huge disparity here in the level of investment that's gone into coffee and particularly variety development. So it's one of the most under-researched and under-innovated crops in the world, especially given its high commercial value. So this is why we see this as an opportunity. There's a huge unmet need and real a whole lot of potential here to really make a difference by addressing uh, coffee breeding and variety development. So, you know, if we're innovating in plant varieties, it, you know, given this disparity and how far behind we are in coffee, there's really so much we can do just by addressing the most obvious basic things. You know, we need pest and disease tolerant varieties. We need improved Improvement in yield, we need climate uh, resilience, and of course, we, we're looking also at uh, cup quality. So, coffee quality is an important element. And by addressing these, these basic traits in our breeding and plant variety development, we at the same time are addressing a whole lot of um, 
sustainability and business challenges, you know, the, the profitability for farmers, reduced use of agrochemicals, and importantly for, for the coffee companies is, you know, the fundamental idea of being able to do more with less, produce more coffee on the same land, it reduces the pressure on deforestation forestation in a lot of coffee um, producing countries, which is increasingly important for the coffee roasters to be able to demonstrate uh, this to their customers. So as I said, our portfolio as an organization really focused on just plant varieties. You know, we know that's where we'll probably get the most bang for our buck in terms of investment. And we need to bring that uh, innovation up to where it needs to be. So we're all about plant varieties, but we have a number of different approaches because a breeding program is the obvious thing to do, but it's a long timeline. It's a long-term investment. And, you know, 10, 10 years would be uh, at best, but really we're looking at 30 years before we have a full pipeline, a breeding pipeline and varieties coming out the other end. So in the meantime, we need to be thinking about um, some other, other approaches to, to get some early wins and start seeing the benefits to, to the producing countries. So we have um, different channels in, in our portfolio. We've, we've got our breeding program starting, uh, but we also have trials. Uh, so this is where we're, we're taking existing varieties around the world and we've negotiated uh, all the access and the IP so that we've got access to these varieties and shared the varieties around around the world. So we've got international um, multi-location variety trials happening with pre-existing varieties and facilitating the exchange and access to those varieties. And then we also have a nursery program, which is, you know, it's not about breeding and varieties per se, but it's absolutely a critical piece. If we have a high performing variety, whether it's an existing variety coming in from another country or something we're developing in our own breeding pipeline, we absolutely need to ensure that the nursery and seed supply, that end of the value chain is functioning um, well, because we need to, to be able to scale up and to get the seed and the varieties in the, in the hands of farmers and they need to know what they're getting. So there's a whole lot of work we're doing with the nursery and seed sector in individual countries to help clean up that system and ensure the varieties are moving out, out to farmers. And then global leadership is a bit of a, a catch-all for a whole bunch of other things that, that we're doing, carbon accounting, tool development, uh, things like that. So that's our portfolio uh, it, a snapshot. I'll just get into it a little, little deep, deeper. So the breeding program is our big investment and certainly it's the thing that's being launched this year. Um, you know, it's, it's been a few years building the, the groundwork, but really we're launching that this year, our breeding network. And certainly that's the reason why I've been brought on. I joined WCR only three months ago, um, but I'm here to really execute the breeding network uh, and scale this up because it's our number one priority going forward. And so we're launching this year, the breeding network uh, in Arabica. So, you know, if you don't know uh, about coffee, coffee it, it generally, it, it's there's two species that are in, in commercial production. There's Arabica coffee, which tends to be your higher end uh, specialty coffee market. Uh, you, you go into a coffee shop, you often see 100% Arabica. It's a bit of a selling feature. So that tends to be the high quality um, coffee. And then there's the Robusta market. So Robusta tends to be, the the bulk coffee uh, mass market it's used for to make instant coffee uh sort of lower end mass market uh, products but increasingly robusta has some different uh different quality traits and so increasingly it's being used in blends um to 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 fill out flavor profile and certain uh, you know, certain types of products. So Robusta is an increasing opportunity. More and more coffee companies are starting to look at it. And I think the idea that Robusta is a lower quality product is perhaps a bit of uh, legacy baggage um, misperception that exists in the industry. I think there's a lot of potential there to improve quality of Robusta as well. But the point is we're launching the Arabica breeding program this year. Robusta is sort of coming along a little bit behind. We're not as far ahead with that one, but ultimately we we do intend to have two breeding programs uh, in both species. So the breeding network that we're launching is nine countries uh, this year. And these, these countries are uh, that 
countries that we've worked with in the past where we have established co collaborations based on our, our previous work in, in trialing coffee varieties. And so they're signing on to be part of the breeding network. And the investment here is it will be about $5 million a year uh, to run this, this breeding network. And it's founded, the, the key point is it's founded on this concept of co-opetition because we know coffee producing countries are intensely competitive with each other. They, you know, they don't want to collaborate or, or, or share. They want to outcompete their neighbouring countries. And so we need to respect that. And certainly the market wants to respect that. The, the buyers, the coffee roasters, they want to encourage this, this competition between countries because that's how we get, you know, we get people to push for innovation, productivity, diversity, uh, all of these things. So it's a good thing, this, this competition. But what we're doing is building a collaborative network where we're asking these countries to collaborate and share. So the model of the breeding, pro breeding program allows for this. And that's why we call it co-opetition because it allows for global sharing and collabor collaboration while simultaneously allowing for each country to do that final stage variety development that meets their own particular needs. So the Global Breeding Network is, um, we're launching it this year, as I said, there's three specific goals uh, in this. So the first is simply to build the network. So to get these coffee producing countries and their national coffee institutes to start collaborating. They're already collaborating with us, but now we, that's a series of bilateral relationships, but now we wanna actually create a network structure where they start to communicate and collaborate with each other. So building those connections, negotiating the agreements, uh, the flow of germplasm data, sharing knowledge, learning from each other. That's the idea that we're, we're plugging all the pieces in together. So that's the first goal. The second one, which is really, I think, probably the most important one is providing genetic resources. So we are sharing the germplasm with all the partners in this network. And so the goal is to improve Arabica populations uh, and share those diverse populations with the partners in the network and allow them freedom to operate, free access to this germplasm to breed and develop as they see fit. So it's really a, a mutual sharing of germplasm amongst the members and open access to allow them to, to, to do whatever they need to do um, and, and release the varieties that meet their needs. The third goal of the network is enhancing capacity. So, you know, WCR is building the network, but we're not doing it all. We're not doing all the breeding. We're doing the population development piece. But what we ultimately want to do is enhance the capacity of all of our partners to do their own breeding and, and variety development. And so each partner in the network is in a bit of a different place. You know, generally speaking, they are much less sophisticated than modern breeding programs. And so we, our goal is to bring them all up and, and it's gonna be a bit of a tailored approach with each partner, depending on what they need. And so there'll be a range of things, you know, there'll be some education programs, maybe we'll do some, you know, tours, bring them to a more modern facility, send them to the coffee roasters in Italy or whatever it takes to broaden their horizons, increase their knowledge, their capacity, their ability to do more modern high throughput breeding uh, with modern genomics techniques and all of that. So enhancing capacity is a big part of it. Uh, and we'll be building that out as we go forward in the network. So basically, you know, how it works from a kind of mechanistic standpoint, you know, as I said, WCR is not doing it all. We are focused on this core population development piece because we have access to all of these diverse varieties. We're doing some initial crosses to bring in this injection of uh, broader diversity than what is, exists right now. And so that's our focus just in the population development end. And then the countries themselves uh, do that endpoint variety development. And so, you know, what we're really doing is we're activating the system. We're injecting resources. We're mobilizing uh, the breeders and facilities in individual countries. We're providing a, an injection of genetic diversity that they haven't seen since the 1960s, which is the last time there's been global sharing of germplasm. So this will be the first time since then. So they'll have a huge injection of genetic diversity into their breeding programs. We're providing funding to them so that they 
can run the trials, where they can plant the trees, collect the data, you know, do the genotyping, all of the things they need to do to be a functional member of the network. So we're funding them directly to do that. We're providing the global coordination of this, uh, all of this, as well, you know, the, as I mentioned, the capacity building piece, providing technology and training to bring them up to a level where ultimately they, they can do this themselves. So here, you know, from a, a science and breeding strategy perspective, this is a, a, a bit of a schematic that shows how, how it's structured. Uh, and there's, you know, we've had a lot of really smart breeders um, design this, this program. Um, I don't know, you probably know Gary Atlin from... Uh, yes, we know him. Yeah, you know him well. So he, he's one of the masterminds of this. And George Koch, my predecessor, so they de developed this, this breeding scheme that's really based on open source, um, open source breeding um, and just, it's a distributed model where ultimately we're doing the, uh, the recombinations at what we call our breeding factory uh, that's in, located in Costa Rica. So we'll have a thousand trees there where we're doing uh, the, the initial crosses will be planted and we're doing the actual uh, selections but the populations are being sent out to each partner. So they get a, a, a portion of the population around 300 odd trees that they will plant on site uh, in their facilities and they will do phenotyping data collection, genotyping uh, of, of every tree will facilitate access to that. So it's a distributed model with centralized recombination, decentralized phenotyping and sharing of germplasm and data back and forth. Uh, through this, you know, so this is the cooperation model. Here is, uh, you know, a bit of a Gantt chart that shows the timeline. So, you know, you, as breeders, you may understand this kind of thing, but this is something we really need to clarify to our, to our member companies because, you know, when they talk about R&D, it's in a product development lab where they can, you know, do things in, in the order of a few months and have a new product out. When we're talking breeding, a timeline of 20 to 30 years is kind of shocking to them and they really struggle to wrap their heads around it. And so, you know, this, this timeline shows you know, the green bars at the top represent the population development piece, which WCR is doing ourselves uh, through multiple cycles of uh, crosses and genomic selection. That's the piece we're doing. And then as we pass this germplasm out to the partners, they will undertake the variety development development, you know, depending on their capacity and their approach that they use, there's a number of different ways they could take it. Uh, and, you know, they may be lucky enough that they see a, a high performing individual in that first cycle even, and they want to just uh, clonally propagate that and release it to, to farmers, you know, they have that option. So depending on, you know, this, the, the type of approach they take to the variety development and the finishing, they could be released releasing varieties, um, commercial varieties at different points along that timeline. And our goal is to support them to do that. So that's the breeding network in a really short summary, um, but there's a whole lot of activity that's happening this year that, you know, right now we're still at the stage of signing, signing the partners on, getting the agreements in place. The crosses have been done uh, and the, the seed will be sent out to the partners in January for planting. And so that will really, really start the whole process um, moving forward. So in terms of the rest of our portfolio, you know, I talked about how we've got things running on different, different timelines. The trials program is something that has been running already for five to seven years in different countries. So we're, this is where we negotiated access to 31 of the top coffee producing varieties from around the world. Uh, and put these same varieties in trials in 22 countries uh, around the world to allow them basically to test out each other's varieties. So this has been running already for about five years. We even have, um, we, this is called our IMLVT, so our International Multi-Location Variety Trial. So in 22 countries, one of which actually is Australia. So we have two sites in Australia where we have uh, these coffee varieties uh, being trials, uh, and that's the University uh, Southern Cross University, who's who's running those trials, and they have a site in Alstonville and Atherton in Queensland. 
So through these, this trialling process, we're facilitating the transfer of varieties between, uh, between countries. So this gives us a much shorter term, shorter term gain for coffee, coffee producing countries. And we've got already, we have countries such as Peru, who's uh, seeing a, a Kenyan variety that's their top performer, and now they're negotiating access that Kenyan variety into Peru and propagate it up for, for their growers uh, in country. I mentioned the nursery piece. So nurseries and seed value chains is really a, a critical piece of this. So there's a lot of work we're doing to strengthen the seed systems, purify seed lots, train nurseries to, it's really about the genetic purity of their varieties. And so one of the tools that we developed um, is, you know, it's a SNP panel where essentially we're using this to genetically fingerprint the each individual tree in a, in a seed lot. And through developing this tool, we've done a lot of work in many countries and many seed lots. And what we found is as many as 85% of trees in seed lots are not genetically pure. They're not what they say they are. And so the, they're selling seed to farmers, they're putting them in the, in, in the ground. You know, it's a big investment. A coffee tree, um, you know, can be used for up to a hundred years. And so if they, they don't have the variety they think they're getting, then it's really a, a setback in the whole system. As we're trying to improve varieties, we wanna make sure those, those varieties are ending up uh, in the farmers and the right varieties in the right places. So the development of this SNP panel, it's a relatively simple tool. We're able to streamline it and um, get the process worked out to really reduce the cost. You know, originally we had an SSR approach to markers, which was costing around $130 per sample, which really wasn't feasible for nursery seed lots in Latin America and other, con other countries around the world. Too expensive, not really accessible. So by converting to a SNP panel approach, we've reduced that price to a as little as four dollars per sample which puts it in the realm of feasibility for both nurseries in in countries but what we've also seen in developing this tool um, now that it's in this realm of affordability it's increasingly of interest uh, in a commercial sense we developed as a as a research tool to help clean up seed lots but now we're seeing this commercial demand for it from individual nurseries and producers who want to genotype their own trees, also from coffee roasters who are very interested in traceability and confirmation of, of the varieties that they're sourcing uh, as they're buying them through the, the supply chain. So this is a a little tool we developed that you know we had a specific purpose in mind, but now there's this commercial opportunity around it and so we're finding ourselves we have to go back now and renegotiate the ip around this because uh it, it's becoming a commercial tool and there's a lot of sensitivity around coffee genetic information and the varieties themselves and how they're used so this is something that we're working through right now Global leadership is the final piece of our portfolio where really it, it's about producing, you know, free open access resources targeted to uh, primarily to farmers, but uh, others in the, in the coffee value chain. And, and these products that we produce, uh, you know, we put them on our website, free, freely accessible. Uh, and we find that this is a really, has been really valuable to a, a number of the producers. So particularly our variety catalog, which has been, been produced in multiple languages. It's been produced in a really nice, clean format with uh, pictures and illustrations. So it's very easy to use, even if uh, uh, farmers are not using it in, in their, their native language, uh, still easy to use and it's a really valuable reference tool for growers in countries around the world as well as a number of other products that you can see here carbon accounting we developed a sensory lexicon as well around um, cupping um, and you know the cupping quality and the ability to describe the the quality uh, traits and parameters of coffee so there's a, there's a whole lot of things we're doing in here in here to support ultimately to support this idea of innovation in coffee, particularly around the varieties uh, and uh, getting them into producing companies.
countries. So that is my overview, you know, I'll just end there, you know, our organization really is all about uh, grow, protect and enhancing the supplies of quality coffee around the world and improving the livelihoods of the farming families who produce it. And we're doing it uh, primarily through plant varieties and breeding. So I'll end there and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, very much, Tanya. So, James, if you can help you, me. There's the questions there. Okay. If you want to use that. I can probably just, they can hear me. Okay. Uh, thanks. It's, oh, okay. So, a question here from Anthony Vanawaden. Is coffee usually grown on its own? roots or grafted grafted so that's uh basically yes <laughs> it's coffee production is very variable around the world in you know different countries different um climatic regions and soil conditions are doing quite different things and so many producers uh, use coffee on its own roots but there's also a lot of grafting particularly in uh, areas that are have strong nematode infect infection problems so indonesia and hawaii are two examples of places which are heavily heavily infested by nematodes so they tend to use grafted grafting onto rootstocks um, and typically they use robusta rootstocks uh, for that because it's more nematode resistance so they're definitely um, all of the above anything and everything Thanks, Tanya. I've got a really good question here from Daniel Otwani about royalties. Mm -hmm. Okay, does the in-country breeding program do the in-country breeding programs get some royalties when varieties shared are commercially exploited in other countries? Yeah, so that's you know that's a really good question. And, and WCR, our philosophy is, you know, I talked about open source. So we are trying to provide broad open access to varieties as much as possible, but we're not the only players in the game. And, and we're also not trying to control what is done in individual countries. So really, you know, similar to the grafting question is anything and everything applies. So what we see with existing varieties, so put our breeding program aside for a minute, but the existing varieties, we see a whole range of different approaches ranging from Colombia, you know, one of those top producing countries has their own varieties that they have developed and they absolutely will not, are not interested in providing access to those varieties to anyone, even at a price. So there's no royalties because there's no access. Those varieties are totally their own and totally locked up. So that's one extreme. We have Then we have uh, Kenya, for example, somewhere in the middle where they have bred some good quality varieties and they are happy for anyone to have access. And there's a simple price. You pay once, pay up front, uh, and then you've got access to that variety. And then there's all kinds of things in between, you know, tra uh, traditional kind of royalty, you know, um, percentages that might be added as well as full open access varieties. There's a lot of varieties that have been developed in public, public breeding programs. And, you know, frankly, it's a bit of wild west out there. You know, there's not many coffee producing countries are really on top of management of plant varieties. So there's been a lot of lack of control of, of plant varieties being shared. You know, farmers typically will take seeds in their pocket, you know, go back to their home country and then that variety now exists in that country, whether it's legal or not, um, is another, another thing. So there's all kinds of um, complexity in the IP uh, and royalty landscape around coffees. That's what exists today. In our breeding program, what we're doing, like I said, it's all open access. We're providing this germplasm. That's all uh, we have freedom to operate. So we've got, we've, we're able to breed with the material. And when we send the germplasm out, the countries can do with it what they want. And so they may choose to breed with it and open release it within their own country, but they may also choose to protect it and, you know, put royalty and licensing arrangements if, they, if they're going to share it with another country. So that really is up to them. We don't have reach through into that. So, you know, I, I guess I answer your question by saying, you know, anything and everything applies, but WCR's intent is not to lock it up. We are not producing proprietary varieties. We are not controlling and licensing. It's all open access. Okay, so there's a follow-up question from Mark Dieters about uh, germplasm. 
Are you able to access natural diversity of Arabica in Ethiopia and of Robusta in mm -hmm. Uganda? And how does this relate to the International Convention on Plant Genetic Resources? So you're getting some controversial questions here. Yeah, so the, I mean, the short answer is, you know, the, the, the diversity in Ethiopia and Uganda is pretty much not accessible. You know, that, uh, that's the short answer to that. We can't access that. Ethiopia is really, um, really closed to uh, sharing germplasm. That's why they are not even part of our network. We have longstanding collaboration and relationships with the breeders in Ethiopia, but they cannot sign on to our network because the fundamental way it operates is we're sharing germplasm. They don't want even germplasm coming in and they don't want data going out. So the the, the way their country regulations are set is that they can't allow for that, that collaboration. So we don't have access to their material, but what we do have is access to uh, collections of Ethiopian material that exist elsewhere in the world that predate the, you know, the, the International Convention, just so the SMTA uh, um, material transfer agreement that is in place, which limits the ability to use this material. So, you know, we we do have Ethiopian diversity that we've incorporated into our breeding program, but we don't have access to newer stuff that they have there, and certainly not wild uh, species. I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of interest in the um, media about wild coffee species like Stenophila and these kinds of things. We're not, we're not touching that. Uh, that's not part of our breeding program because fundamentally there is enough diversity in the varieties that are in circulation now. It's just that diversity doesn't exist in all places. And so that's kind of the benefit of what we're doing. We have access varieties from India, from Costa Rica, from Honduras, from Kenya. Each of those breeding programs have only had a very narrow diversity that they've been working with in their own programs, but they're diverse between the programs. And so we've brought all of that in and that in itself is giving us a huge amount of diversity that really hasn't ever been seen before in coffee breeding. So while we don't have access to Ethiopia and Uganda, their, their diverse sort of center of origin type material, we have enough diversity to work with to really be able to push the bar forward. So we don't see it as a limitation uh, at this point. I think that so far we, we, we can go without having to tap into that yet. Okay, so I might ask a follow-up question um, about Arabica genetic diversity. Mm -hmm. So based on our BPATs yeah. um, of the East African programs, our observation was that the genetic base might be quite narrow, mm -hmm. now, given that they're the centre of origin. So my question was going to be another slightly controversial one. Yeah. At no stage do I think you'd be able to use a transgenic mm -hmm. approach. Um, and I guess my concern with your comment about using genomic selection in a fairly narrow genetic base might be, it may work, it, it may be problematic. But what I was going to suggest, what about a gene editing approach? Would that, can that potentially be used, do you think? Yeah, you know, we absolutely see potential in gene editing. Um, our, our our challenge is as, as an industry organization, we have to pay attention to the market end. And you, you know the consuming public, they don't want anything to do with GMOs. Uh, so we have a policy, we're not touching genetically modified coffee. Gene editing is a bit of a gray zone still. You know, we don't have a policy against it. You know, as, as scientists, we love all that stuff. We want to be able to use whatever tools um, we have available to us, but we need to pay attention to the consumer, consumer end and the roasters that are investing in this. They don't want that yet. They don't know what it is, so we're leaving it alone. And, and like I said, we still see such potential to be able to do so much just with you know fairly conventional breeding you know we can use modern genomics approaches to try and you know to to, to fast track it and 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 put a higher throughput and and identify the exact high performing material that we want but we don't really need to get into you know genetic modification gene editing yet i think there's still a lot we can do yeah, so we're well, not hanging fruit yeah exactly yeah yeah, that, oh, sorry. Yeah, so there was a uh, question here from Malusu 
who actually is from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. What is your strategy to tackle seed-borne seedling diseases when you transfer germplasm across mm -hmm. border regions? Yeah, so we're we're sending out seed for a start. We're not sending plants. Uh, so, so you know, it'll be limited to whatever might be on the seed. And we are absolutely, you know, concerned that, uh, you know, the biosecurity issues are being followed. So, you know, right now, as we speak, uh, we have all of the cross, original initial crosses have been done at our farm in El Salvador. And we have a technician there who is, you know, he's bringing, uh, doing a, a pathology assessment on, on the trees before harvest to make sure we're not collecting diseased material. And we have all of the phytosanitary information for every country to make sure we're following the phytosanitary guidelines. Some countries have a quarantine protocol on top of that. So all of those protocols are all being followed. And we're, you know, we absolutely understand that this is, this is a, a risk and, and a, a potential barrier to sending sending seed into these countries. So we're, we're doing a practice run with that to make sure we really understand what's involved and, and manage that risk. So it's something top of mind for sure. Thank you. Go ahead, Craig, you had a question. Yeah, I was gonna ask, um, do we know how heritable um, traits influencing coffee quality are? So I, I think the short answer is no, we don't know enough about co coffee quality. And, you know, I, I come from horticulture where we used uh, consumer and sensory science to inform our breeding program. So I'm familiar with how you can really target breeding towards specific consumer traits. In coffee, there's a, this... Uh, the, qual the culture and quality is, is very entrenched around this cupping protocol, which I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it, it's not very scientific. Uh, and, and coming from, you know, consumer and sensory science, uh, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with how, how widespread this protocol is because it's really very subjective. And, and we, you know, we've even done an analysis of cupping scores to show how variable these are. They're not really very robust. So it would make me uncomfortable to target, create breeding targets around using that quality tool. I think, um, I think uh, we can look for specific, you know, uh, flavor chemicals that are positive or negative in liking. We can actually, you know, metabolomics or or more scientific approaches to be able to target some of those things so that's one of the things we're doing as a bit of a side project we're exploring some of those things to be able to develop see if we can develop more scientific tools that can can be used for screening for screening for quality traits so the, in the industry, there's a lot of perception around quality and entrenched ideas yeah. but we're trying to cut through a bit of that and find a more scientific approach to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I guess that was partly from what we were finding out in the BPAP was that there seemed to be a, a, a strong belief that quality was due to environment, locale mm. influences. And also there's some research that had been done here with Robert Henry and uh, Dennis Smythe, but they were telling me that they didn't find a lot of variation for, I think it was genes in influencing quality. Now that doesn't mean there's no genetic variation for the phenotype, but I guess the interest is if you're investing in breeding programs that are trying to change quality, if there's not genetic variation for it, then... I think there is, absolutely. Right. Yeah, there, there is there is genetic influence on, on quality. Coffee, the challenge with coffee is the end product. There are so many factors involved. You know, you start with your genetics, you've got your production environment, environmental influence on that. And then there's all the processing piece. So it's, very, it's a lot similar to wine. You know, if you think about the wine industry, that final glass of wine that you're tasting, there's so many things involved in that, which does include absolutely the varietal. 
You know, people know wine by the varietal. They know it by the region it's grown, the terroir. You know, this is embedded in the wine culture. We all understand that. Coffee is very similar. You know, like the wine making process, just like the coffee roasting process, even how it's, uh, you know, how it's processed coming off the trees, whether there's like the how the ferment fermentation stage is handled, all of those things have a huge impact on quality. So when we have down at the end, you have a coffee buyer doing a cupping and, you know, creating a quality score, it, there's so many factors involved, you know, and it's really trying to dissect that is really very challenging, but absolutely genetics, it, it pay, pays, a, 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 plays a role in that. So we have five minutes to go. And as the chair, I might ask another question, all right. uh, given that I think we've exhausted all the questions on the list. So it was pretty clear to us, Tanya, when we evaluated coffee programs in East Africa, that an instant kick that smallholders could make is by growing hybrid varieties. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this would apply more to Arabica rather than because yeah. it's a self-pollinating species. However, um, the, the problem is being able to multiply a hybrid plant mm -hmm. in Arabica has been a, a real stumbling block. Yep. So the thing that comes to mind as a hybrid breeder of, of field crops is using a strategy like cytoplasmic male sterility. Mm -hmm. I don't think that exists in, in Arabica. Um, or, or alternatively, um, clonal propagation. Mm -hmm. And again, it seems that Arabica is more difficult to clonally propagate than Robusta. Yeah. So um, you haven't mentioned clonal hybrids. propagation hybrids. Um, yeah. So is there a eye on the ball there? Absolutely. So, you know, I talked about our trials program, trialing pre-existing varieties. The other piece of our trials is hybrids, which I didn't I didn't mention, but we, we have um, created a few hybrids from creating hybrids out of some high performing varieties. And we've completed, I think it's five years of trials that's happened all, all right now. And we've, um, you know, we've basically got, we've got four hybrids, high performing, which are comparable to existing, there are existing coffee hybrids on the market. And so we are at the point where we're moving, moving these hybrids out into pre-commercial trials. But the issue is around hybrids, as, as you know, the progeny of hybrids segregate. And when coffee is generally, most places in the world, coffee is propagated by seed and farmers typically save seed. And so this inherently is a problem if you are putting hybrids out there and the farmers don't understand how hybrids work and they save the seed just like they've always done and then the progeny segregate then you've got a risk to the entire coffee supply and so we have our eye on this risk um, absolutely so while we're trialing hybrids where we have an economist that we're engaging to understand the capacity within country to deal with hybrids and their propagation systems that they have in place their variety management systems the general awareness of hybrids and, and we're really being selective about how we release those hybrids because we don't want to release these hybrids on a, for an open release in a country that's not ready to deal with them. And largely, generally speaking, African countries are not ready to deal with coffee, coffee hybrids. And so we've been very cautious about that. Um, and we're focusing in Latin America. Latin America, there is hybrids already in production in some countries and different capacity levels and willingness to deal with it. So we're cautiously going into Latin America first. The the clonal propagation question, you know, I coming into coffee, it was very curious to me why, why there isn't more clonal propagation happening. And when you talk to people about cl clonal propagation, it's always somatic embryogenesis, which to me, it, this is a, a kind of high tech, high input method. And why is that the method of choice? To me, you know, why aren't we using something simpler, micro cuttings or or whatever and so i think you know i'm sensing that there's an opportunity here to to really enhance the ability for clonal propagation to happen in various countries and to get this up and running which ultimately will support variety introductions whether it's hybrids or you know true breeding varieties i think clonal propagation is a way to sort of preserve preserve uh, that genetic identity and also scale up really quickly so I think I think we need to 
do both. You know, we need to enhance the capacity in, in the propagation capacity, not just in the seed system, but also clonal propagation. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but no, yeah absolutely. we have our eye on hybrids, absolutely. Okay, so I think we've timed this perfectly, Tanya. Great. Thank you for an excellent presentation given that you've landed in the country across the weekend, <laughs> yeah. uh, no doubt jet lagged. And it's a pleasure for UQ to be interacting with a non-profit organisation like World Coffee Research. And uh, UQ has a history of co collaborating uh, in that space to help uh, developing countries, small, uh, small landholders yeah. to uh, increase their profitability. So um, we hope that we can continue the interaction and uh, We'll have you back soon. Great. I'm obviously always happy to come back to UQ and uh, visit my family in Australia. Yeah, great. So thanks for having me, really. it's It's been great. And I think uh, there's probably some good follow-up conversations to be had. <laughs>